match. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Sportsman. We've got a very special one coming to you guys today. But first, as always, Mikey V, Joey D, I'm the big ticket. Uh, first guest, really. I mean, Joe and I did one a long time ago, but this is our first real guest. Um, certainly the first one we have with Mikey V and our first athlete. So today, first athlete's have, huge. Yep. First, we have uh, starting guard, UNC Tar Heels, number three, Cormac Ryan. Very happy to have him on the program. What do you, what do you, and let's bring him in. What? And let's bring him in. in. Let's bring him in because tickets, Wi Fi, we don't know. We don't know how much. Oh, longer this is it's a got choppy Wi Fi. We don't know how much longer it's got. And there he is. Oh, welcome. Wow. Oh. That's a nice there backdrop, is. man. That is a nice backdrop. That is a how nice we doing? Backdrop. Clap it up. Clap hey. it up. Hey, look at the hey. Tar Heel behind him. That's hey. sensational. Dude, hey, Mikey, B, I see you. I see you. I got some little light blue on there, too, myself. The ACC Player of the Week, Cormac Ryan. Can we right. say the yeah. Blue Devil Killer, Cormac Ryan? <laughs> we could, we could the record-setting performance in Cameron Indoor Sensational. Stadium. Sensational. Cormac. Yeah. I always want to start off by saying that you're our first ever athlete on the Sportsman. So it's our 100th episode and our first athlete. So a big, big one today. We're so thrilled to have you on here, man. I appreciate that. What an honor. I had no idea. First ever. That's insane. Yeah. yeah, well, very deserving of it, Cormac. And coming off of that fresh performance Saturday against the Dukies, uh, I'm sure you're in a very good way right now, as are the boys. How are we That's feeling right. heading into the ACC tournament, my friend? Oh, man, we're feeling we're feeling good. We're fired up. I think it was uh, – I mean, there's nothing better than walking into that building and coming out as champs. Um, we were – honestly, like, we we they kind of wrote us off going into that game. I think, you know, the the – not that we we look at the, these kind of things particularly, but you know the line was a little aggressive for for the Blue Devils. I think the the odds were against us. And um, look, that was like it was for a share of the the title for the regular season. And there's nothing worse than splitting it with your rival. And so we went in and and handled business. So we're we're fired up, man. We're going to DC, fired up. It's awesome, man. You guys swept them, so I don't know why that was the case. Right. I have a question for you because. You mentioned, you know, looking at the lines. Do you guys take much in terms of like when you see a line like that that you think is a little bit maybe on the tad disrespectful side? Does that like fire you up at all, or does that change like your preparation or your mentality going into the game at all, or is that something you don't really focus on? It's, I mean, it's crazy because like when I started college way back when I'm like the oldest guy in college basketball, which is like <laughs> a bit, a bit, Stan a Stanford. The Notre Stanford, Dame, Notre Dame, UNC. Yeah. Via, well, because the York. COVID year. Via, via New York. COVID. Via New yep. York, correct? Via New York City. Yes, sir. Born and raised in New York so City. So there's no um, need to have the conversation about best pizza or best bagel because Cormac already knows who, who, right. who reigns supreme in that arena. Yes. That's right. That's right. Um, and there's not a lot of good pizza, unfortunately, anywhere anywhere else um, as right. I've traveled the world. That's um, right. And, but That's we're right. spoiled. Like, we're spoiled. And, and you know right. that. Yes, sir. Um, but... No, like when I first started playing there, like, like sports betting, especially like, you know, with college stuff and, and like, it was, it wasn't as big, like it just like, it was big, but it wasn't as like, um, like publicized, like on the telecast and everything like now, like you're watching the, the college game days of the world, you're watching ESPN, the line, like the lines everywhere, the over-unders everywhere. Like it's crazy. It, it, and it, it is what it is. It's, it's good. I think it's good for the sport. I think it brings more people in, but like, like I, I, it's people are like, Oh, you should never know the line. You should never know this. And, and that's right. Like, you know, we focus on the game, we prep for the game, but like it's advertised, like it's just advertised before and after during, like, you know, it's, it's a big part of the sport now, which is kind of wild. Cause like literally in five years, it's changed. Like my freshman year, you couldn't find like the line was not on TV. It wasn't on the pregame show. Like it just wasn't. And now that's like all anyone can talk about is, is what, uh, what the spread is, you know, what, who's got what, you know, so. Sports gambling's taken over, man. It's insane. Tar Heels, it's be hard to Tar Heels have done very well for the over. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hey, listen. As long as the brotherhood's eating, as long as as long yeah. as the brotherhood's eating, yeah. that's, right. that's yep. right. That's right. Yep. That's right. Now we did, uh, Cormac. We did put out 
uh, a questionnaire for viewers to be able to ask you some questions. So we'll definitely have some questions about that. But I know we can't overlook the ACC tournament. Obviously, that's a big deal in and of itself. But getting ready for the for the big tournament and March Madness to start very soon. Um, how is the overall vibe? And obviously, it's a little tough when you still have games yet to play. But um, the overall vibe, you think, heading into the big dance um, and where you could see this team going? Because preseason, all jokes aside, I did say that I thought – coming off of last year and then adding you from Notre Dame and, and, you know, RJ Davis now, obviously the season that he's had, he's been unbelievable. Your coach winning uh, coach of the year in the ACC, like all this stuff coming to fruition for you guys. And I'm a big Baycock guy too. I think he's tremendous. Where, how do you see your guys chances in the big dance? Obviously I know you, you know, as a player, your competitiveness, you're going to say that you're, you know, one of the top teams and contenders, but how do you feel um, heading into the big tournament? Yeah, I mean, um, like you said, I think, honestly, it's not only can we not overlook the ACC tournament, um, I think it's important for us to win the ACC tournament for our our seeding, honestly. Like, I think we win the ACC tournament, we've got a really good shot at a one seed. Um, and that for us, like, there's all this bracketology nonsense that's hard to follow, honestly. It, like, even when you're in the middle of it, like, I, we know everything, we've seen all these teams all year, it's hard to follow, like, where you're playing, who you're playing against, like, you can't get wrapped up too much in that because you'll just kind of lose focus of, of, you know, what you need to be focused on. But um, I think for us, like our group, like you said, they had kind of that crazy run two years ago at UNC to the yeah. finals as an eight seed, um, be up 15 at half in the national championship game, end up losing in a very tight game, heartbreaking stuff. And then their preseason number one last year, tough season, you know, stuff happens. Basketball happens. It's a crazy sport, especially college. Uh, they don't make the tournament. And so it's like, all right, well, now it's like you've had the best of the best, basically, and then the worst of the worst. So it's like you're splitting the difference. And year three with Coach Davis and our crew this year, like, has been so far so good. Like, we have had a pretty successful season. We wanted to win the regular season. Um, but, like, March is a different animal. It just is. Yeah. Because you get these teams, like, everybody i mean you talk about hungry like the the big dance your your winner go home it just is what it is and these teams are good they're different from who you play all year they're not usually from your league um which is why you get all these upsets because you you're getting different styles you're getting these teams super hungry um but i i mean look i like our chances i i think we've got a really talented group we've got an older group which helps we've got guys who've been there before um we've got a deep team. We've got a lot of guys who we can go to on the bench um, who come in and are just tremendous players for us. And so uh, obviously it's one game at a time starting Thursday in the ACC tournament, but we're excited, man. Like we're excited to get to the big dance and, and you know, make a deep run, hopefully go and end up in Phoenix cutting down nets. Would you think that maybe like not coming in as like the, you know, undisclosed one seed maybe takes a little bit of pressure off. Obviously you want to win the ACC tournament and I hope you guys do, but I think this season up until now, you guys have kind of been a little bit forgotten about and maybe that, you know, I think there's so much pressure coming in to a big tournament like this as the one seed that sometimes, you know, you got all these other teams gunning for you. Uh, do you agree with that? Or do you think it's really irrelevant? It's just, you know, it's, it's based off of who you're playing in the matchups and whatnot. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good point. Like when you're, when you're ranked number one, obviously there's like the whole narrative of like the one and 16 matchup. And like, you see Purdue last year, like FD comes storming in and you just get some gritty guys. Like you get St. Peter's, you get a couple of Jersey guys battling and, and I'm like, you're you knocking tough off guys, tough guys, out there. Tough guys, tough guys in Jersey. Guys. No, they're scrappy really guys, battlers, battlers. They are, hey, and, and they play, they play different. They, that's the thing is like, these teams are built differently. They're not always kind of what they're used to, like what you're used to seeing. And teams I think can get tired in their conference. They're just seeing a lot of the same. And then you get into the tournament and you just play a completely different team. So honestly, like, Again, like one seed, two seed, wherever we end up, it's just you got to win the game in front of you. And that's just the mentality. It's just as simple as that. I think if you do too much calculating of like who we're going to play, where we're going to play, I'm like that that stuff gets dangerous quick because, you know, you're 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 thinking a little bit too much. Um, so it's it really is. It sounds cliche, it, it, but it's like you show up and you've got to win the game in front of you. And it just is. That's just how you got to do it, especially in March. Who's the, who's the most physical team that you guys played this year in conference? Do you think? 
Was it Duke? Because, you know, Duke is known, you know, they played pretty good defense this year. But in terms of physically, like, after the game, you felt, like, a little beat up after the game. Like, man, they really, like, are are tough in every aspect, running the floor, boxing out, everything done at a, at a, at a very physical level. Who would you say was the most physical team you guys went through this year? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, look, we played Tennessee in the non-conference, and they've they're, they've got Rick Barnes. They're always – they're, they're – MO is like, we're going to be physical. We're going to be tough on D. We're going to be physical. We beat them. We beat them at home, yep. uh, which is a great game for us. Kind of set the tone early in the non-conference for us. But they're physical, and that's kind of what they do. That's what his brand is. I would say, like, in conference, um, Clemson's pretty physical. Um, you know, Coach Brunel there, like, they they play physical. They they crash the glass. They that was set, a tough game for you guys, that one game against Clemson. Set, yeah, they set good yeah. screen. And so we got it. Like, we got them at their place they were ranked you know like 16th or something and we we went down there and won like we won by yeah. 10 double figures on the road which was great and then they came in here kind of we were came out sleepy yeah. uh it yeah. wasn't our best first game time they beat you guys in like 40 that, yeah, that was like that. was that after the first duke game that game it was. yeah it was. It was yeah the hangover yeah. game yeah um, yeah which yeah. is tough and it's that's a real that's a reality of sports um is uh, that was a quick turnaround i think it was a saturday monday or saturday tuesday yeah like, yeah um, yep. 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 it comes quick and they're a good team like they're a good team and and you get beat you get you get beat by anybody in this league yeah. um and and it's honestly it's a good learning lesson it's better to do it when you win it's better to win an ugly game and be like oh you know that was close but um good lesson for us you know good lesson for sure. Hey, you know what? You can't do without a little bit of adversity. And by the way, Mikey mentioned Duke. If you ever listened to the Sportsman Show before, he said he, he thought Duke could do it all. So I think your guys' performance yeah, last true. this past week might have changed his impressions, hopefully. And yeah. now he might have had, you know, a different team in there <laughs> aside. One would hope so. But I want to ask you a fun question because – uh, I don't want to be too serious. I obviously had an unbelievable game this past week. And I got to ask, like, cause I know me, I'm a little bit of a nut job when I had a good game. When yeah, I was, you're a sick, you're a sick pop Joe. Yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah. I got, I got, I got a little fuse is not oh, right. You really are. Yeah. <laughs> I like this Cormac kid. Let me tell you. Yeah, me too. My question is after a big game like that, like, do you have like a go-to meal? Like uh, food's just got to taste better. You're the one. player of the week. Like what? One. What's is it like a steak dinner you're doing after, one. or you're just doing a, like a full pizza? Or like what? What? What's a go-to dinner for you after a big game like that? That's a great question. So I'll I'll, I'll give you a little bit of insight into the post game because as much as I would love to to be able to go out for like a, a big time meal, like I'd love to just grab my family or whoever's at the game, the the boys and. Let's just hit, let's just hit a steakhouse. We do um, usually after a game, especially like a night game, we're going to do uh, they'll just cater food from like a, a restaurant, like a local restaurant, like that's in our locker room. So like, we'll, we'll basically play the game, win the game. And then we've got food on the bus for the Duke game. It's a little different because um, the tradition here in, in Chapel Hill is in you, when you beat Duke, the entire student body and the entire basically city of chapel hill storms what we, we it's called franklin street it's like our main strip and uh it's a pretty insane scene honestly um if you i saw you i saw you on top of the bus this week right listen i was on top of the bus i ended up you call me a sick poppy you're right no, i was on top bus. of the bus i mean listen it was I, the I, cormac ryan game it was dubbed the cormac ryan fair enough. Fair guy fair dropped enough. 31 against the dukies and cameron you're gonna walk on top of the bus so, so our coach, coach Davis came in the locker room and was like, uh, you know, we're celebrating, we're throwing waters around. Like we're, we're fired up. He's uh, he's like, we're going to take the bus to Franklin street. And we're like, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. So we, we drive, we drive the bus basically into a, a mob, like into, <laughs> into a, a, a crowd of people. Um, not at full speed, obviously we slowed down, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that, sounded, that sounded bad. We didn't drive the bus into the people, but. So we're surrounded by everyone. So we we go out of the bus, and it's crazy. And, and and listen, like this is my first year here, so I'm I'm new to this whole thing. Like this is nuts to me, and it's nuts in general, but it's nuts to me. Like we didn't as great as Notre Dame was, as great as you know Stanford was, and other college. Like I don't know if there's anything like this in terms of like we're there's people as far as the eye can see. People are screaming, you know, throwing stuff, waters going crazy. Um, we did that. People are chanting, playing music. 
And uh, we get back on the bus and we're, you know, we can't go anywhere. We're surrounded by people. And, um, you know, we've all been on coach buses. They got those little hatches, like the little emergency hatch. Yeah. So I, get, I get one of our big guys over there and I'm like, yo, you got to help me get this thing open. And he's <laughs> like, let's do it. And so we're like, we're fiddling with it. We're He like punches through the thing. It pops open. And I'm like, dude, I'm getting on the bus. So I climb through, they hand me up the trophy. A couple of the guys get on. So I'm like on top of the bus. Like That's nuts, it man. was nuts. It was completely nuts. Um, little slippery up there. So I'm glad I didn't fall. It would have been a, a tough. Uh, oh man, tough forget scene. it. <laughs> forget it. Tough tough scene. It was that raining. was my first thought. Honestly, I was like, you got to protect the assets here, man. I was like, get that's that what my mom the... said. My, <laughs> that was my easy. Was that's like... I'm a dad. So it's like, I, that yeah. was my first thing. Like, right. Hey, Gormack, get down off. Get, yeah. get down from there. We, we can't afford stick. any kind of an ankle twist yeah. right before the tournament starts. We no, that would have been, that would have been from like hero to zero right there. I would have been on like <laughs> that top 10, like sliding off the side of the bus, squashing some freshmen. Um, but yeah, no, it was fun. Fun night. Really. Did fun. you get dinner after the bus or what did you guys do? Yeah, so we did. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really dinner, intrigued man. about big dinner. dinner I'm really guy. intrigued about big the dinner, dinner guy. guy. I'm really. Yeah, big dinner guy. Um, we did. Um, what do we do? No, we, I think we ate our food on the bus, honestly, and just went, we went right okay. out. We kind of, we have Saturday night. We, we got together, kind of went out on the town. Um, Do me a favor, a or Mac, if you guys, if you guys win March Madness, go, go get yourself a good steak dinner. Okay. Well, we're going to, um, we're going to treat well, yourself. You deserve a nice dinner. <laughs> You know, I'll be rooting for you. And by the way, if I'm anywhere in the vicinity, just like hit me up. I, I, oh, I'm yeah. Like, oh, you wow. see, it. Take it. do you see this how this is where always, this is going? This is always, oh, it, that's this where is so typical. This is, just, this yeah. is like a, a 20 minute ploy to get a dinner invite with the yeah, That's party. right. Yeah, that's that's right. right. You're invited. You're invited. I guarantee it. There you and we'll go. be in Phoenix. I, I, we'll be out in Arizona. For not reasons crazy. of my own, I hope you win for your own personal benefit and your own history and like, your, you know, the personal. Like you know, amazing, amazing story that that would be. But I would love to be, to be able to witness that. I think it would be sensational. <laughs> the the win or the dinner, the both, dinner. Oh well, well, yeah. well, I will be watching. But the dinner, <laughs> the dinner. I, I got Bob and I are big dinner guys. It's just oh, I know, I know. You really nothing up. better than when you're with your friends. No, it's celebrating a moment, can't and it's it. just it's just like time stands still. Cormac, these, these guys live for dinner. The whole th anytime we're filming an episode of Bob Does Sports, <laughs> all they can think about is how good dinner is going to taste. Oh yeah, because they worked hard. They filmed two episodes that day. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. I grew up. I grew up doing. Uh, we called it late long dinner. Like you go late night and you go long and you just and you sit. You close the restaurant down. Um, right. And and I grew up like growing up in the city. You, these places stay open late like they start I'll, I'll sit down to dinner at 10 p.m like we'll sit down eat till midnight like it's uh that why that's how that's how the ryan family rolls so i'm i'm all on the dinner train i agree there's nothing better than just locking in for just great banter great uh great food awesome. can't beat it can't beat it that's right sounds like the ryan's and the demars could could have quite a hey, dinner. listen listen we could get we could make, make something happen Hey, if you're no. if you're a subpar golfer, you know maybe we'll get along really well too. <laughs> we could actually play toe to toe on the golf course together. That's right. <laughs> do you like I actually, oh, do well, you get? That, yeah, that's a good question. Do you dabble with golf? So I just like I uh, first of all, big, I'm a big uh, Bob does sports guy. I love your guys. Wow, we love so, you. No, it's true. It's true. I I uh, you guys got you guys got the gift, man. It's, it's fun to watch. Um, the. Uh, as a golf, I just started golfing this year, so I'm not, I'm not good. I'm not good at all. Um, I think well, I've golfed for a long time, and I'm not good either. So you yeah, got that's you. right. I mean, you're not bad though. You're not bad though, Joe. You no, got, I'm okay. I'm okay. You got a, uh, you, you got some, you got some oomph in your in your game, which I don't have. Like that's something I don't, I don't have. But based on like the guys who I've golfed with, who are, uh, you know, know what they're doing, they their theory is that given enough time, like it, any type of athlete can kind of pick it up. And I think, I think they're right. Like I, I'm not terrible and I haven't golfed much. So I I'm confident. Like if I gave it the, the amount of practice, like if I just played, you know, four or five times a week for a couple weeks, like I would get to a point where I'd be okay. Um, but that being said, I haven't done that. Cause it, I mean, dude, it, it takes a lot of time. Like, that's the thing, like practicing, playing like golf is like, it's not as, easy to to rep and get better at so like i'm trying to get better i'd love to like i don't even have clubs like i need clubs like i my guy my guy is gonna you got march madness to worry about first so let's not that's get right. too worried yeah. about the, and then you Cormac, the dinner make, to worry about yeah, Cormac, make sure 
make sure if this guy hits you up for a dinner, tell him to tell Callaway to send you a nice set of balls. Okay? There's a little exchange there. All right. Make sure that we'll, we'll do a little tip for tat. We'll do a little yeah. tip for Good tat. Good March Madness showing out of you. We could get you in Callaway clubs pretty quickly, my man. Good right. March Madness showing out of you. This guy's unbelievable, man. <laughs> Jesus. Unbelievable. Jacob, what were you going to ask him? Mac, I actually have. I have a question for you, and I apologize. I've been a little quiet just because my Wi-Fi is just just atrocious, so I kind of wanted to stay out of the way. But I am curious. You touched on how special that Duke UNC rivalry is, and you know, growing up in Manhattan, uh, and then I, I believe you went to Mass, you went to Milton, I think, for school, right. and high school, yep. and then Stanford, and then Notre Dame. How long did it take you coming in uh, and playing for UNC before you you were like, okay, I I get the rivalry here. I I, I understand it. Yeah, I mean, I, it's pretty right away. It's pretty immediate. Um, I think part of it, too, is like, I think everybody gets it to a certain extent. Like, even if you you don't go here, you know about it. And it's yeah. like, right. I think it's the greatest rivalry in sports. And it's a it's a good it's a good dinner debate topic. I'll tell you that. Like, you could talk about, you know, Red Sox, Yankees, Celtics, Lakers, you know, Barca, Bears, Packers, Madrid, Bears, Packers. <laughs> like, there's some legendary rivalries. Ohio like, State, Michigan. Ohio State, Michigan's one. That's a serious one. Like the Duke Carolina one's in the conversation. I My argument is because it's like there's never been a year or a period of years where it didn't really matter or it wasn't really close. Like if you look at the stats, they're kind of scary. Like it's almost to the point tied like over the course of 50 years. It's nuts. Um, so like everyone kind of knows about the rivalry coming in. And so you're like, yeah, Duke Carolina. And then when you're here, it's like, it's real. Like it gets real quick. Right. Um, and that the buzz around campus, like we played them here first. We'll play mid, we play mid season and end of season and it alternates. So we played them here first and the buzz on campus was like unbelievable. They had college game day here. You know, everyone's got the signs it's going crazy. And then the game itself, like we'll, we'll sell out every game, which is cool. Like we've got an amazing arena. The Dean Dome will sell it out 22,000 seats. But for some reason, like you, the, the buzz, like, in the gym when it's the Duke sellout is different. It just, it was completely out of this world. Like you, you kind of just black out, you know, you don't even know what's going on. And then obviously going into Cameron, it's like, they're, they're sleeping in tents. I didn't even know really about this tenting. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most yeah. ludicrous things I've ever heard. Yeah. It's unbelievable. You got yeah. grown men, <laughs> yeah. grown men and women sleeping outside for yeah. months. I've never understood it's that. Me. It's not for me. I, it's not, for, it's I couldn't imagine it's for anybody, but, I'll tell you this. When you look in the student sections after the win and you're like, you guys slept outside for months for this. It's great. <laughs> pretty sweet. It's yeah, pretty that's sweet. Great. That's great. I have pretty a question sweet. from the jet and he, I told him that we were interviewing you today. And he, it's a very interesting question, which I didn't even know, but he, he was like, you got to ask him this. So apparently um, in, in Duke, the, the basketball like the nets are suspended from the ceiling, whereas yeah. all the other courts, yep. they're just from the ground up. His question was, does it make a difference when you're shooting on the on the basket? Apparently, you're better on that. I was going to say. I was going to say. Yeah, I've liked so it. Maybe a couple when times you go to the, yeah, maybe that's what you need for moving forward because that was unbelievable. But he asked if there was a difference, a significant difference you found when you're shooting on a. I don't even know that. Yeah, it's so yeah, it's it's interesting. Basically, what he's talking about is most of the every college has like the stanchion, so it comes up from the ground, looks like the NBA hoops. You know, the one Shaq breaks the backboard, the thing falls down. Like this one is because Cameron's so small; it's literally like the size of a, a public school, high school gym. It's tiny. Like it, they pack ten thousand people in there, but like if you walked in there when it's empty, you'd think you're almost in the wrong place. Like the I remember the first time I walked in there. I couldn't believe how small it was. We walked in there for shoot around a couple of years ago. And I was like, you know, this, this is it. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's tight. Like it's a, it's a tiny gym so they can hang it from the ceiling. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it makes a difference. I think it is a little different uh, for maybe the first couple minutes of warmups, but I think everybody by this point has played enough basketball. Like it's, it's honestly kind of the same. I mean, it's regulation height. Like it's all fine. Um, and 
it, it honestly reminded me of back in like high school, you play on some of those, you know, with a bass yes. swing yes. down from the yes. ceiling and they, yes. they put it back up for the volleyball. They would team. crank it. Remember they yeah, would and crank you got a guy, you got the poor yeah. janitor yeah. over there, yeah. like yeah. Yeah. cranking yeah. on his shoulder. You need the yeah. key, Mikey. Yes. You, did. yes. you yes. make friends with hey, you make friends with the with the janitor. So when it's after hours, you tell me, oh, can you can you bring 100%. the hoops down? You gotta bring the hoops down. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of like that. Um, but that's a that's a very astute question from from the jet. I tell you what, man, this guy's mind works in a way that no one else <laughs> yeah, he, he's got a beautiful mind, that guy he does. <laughs> beautiful mind and a wonderful scowl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tim, do you want to read some of the uh, the audience questions? Yeah. Let's get to it. Um, we've got a few questions here. We asked some of the fans uh, some questions for Cormac. Um, and the first question comes from Richard Patterson. He wants to know your favorite moment this year sweeping Duke. If there was one moment between the two games sweeping them that really sticks out to you, probably other than the bus thing. The bus was, was big. big. The bus was big. I will say that's, that's definitely going to be a memory uh, for life. I would say – uh, this most recent one, since it's fresh, is is definitely sticking out. Um, I like. I've always personally liked playing road games more. I, I, you know, I think if you looked at the stats, I, I bet you I probably play better on the road. I don't know why that is. It's just I kind of get. I find it easier to get going when everyone's like, basically, telling you to go. You know, yep. f off, and kill yourself. But it's <laughs> I just like it better. Um, it's uh, so I would say probably the Duke game at Cameron. One of the one of the moments that I was just like honestly stunned about was when uh, my boy Elliot, number two, Elliot Cadeau, at the end of the game, hit like a double pump end of shot clock, which was really like a, a dagger. It was like they were kind of clawing back. We were not doing the best job closing the game out. And he threw up kind of a prayer, like end of a shot clock prayer. And it went in. And we had been like a couple times this year, we had been beat because of something kind of like that, like a, a shot banks in from half court or like a guy's throwing up some nonsense at the end of the clock and it goes in. So we'd been on the receiving end of a couple of those. And so to see one kind of go our way in that game to really kind of put the nail in the coffin, I was like, I literally like put my, my hands shot up. I couldn't believe, I was just so happy. Um, I would say that probably, you know, his shot right there was was all, and then kind of just the whole moment, like the whole winning and walking yeah. off was, was taking a look at your home and away splits and uh, your three point percentage on the road is 40% on the road as you know, opposed Mike, to, as opposed to watching as opposed to 30% at home. <laughs> There's something to the away. I said on the one UNC pick that they, the UNC Instagram, when they put up that picture of you, I said Cormac's on, on demon time in this picture. Because <laughs> it looks like he is completely, completely enamored with the villain role. And he, and like Cormac, it. in my defense, you put up a picture of the Joker on, sure on your did. last post, riding sure. in the cop car. So I think he does embrace <laughs> that villain role. I think there's something to that, which is oh bad gosh. news for everybody in the NCAA tournament, because those are all technically away games. So that's bad news. Yeah. That's bad news. <laughs> yeah. all right we got another question here from uh, this one comes from alice warts humphreys she wants to know have you ever run into any of the duke players while out at the bars or getting something to eat because yeah what is it? it's only like eight or nine miles down the road yeah it's close it's way closer than i thought actually it's it's like a 20 minute drive like maybe less which is kind of wild um when you really think about just the chances of two schools being that close ending up in such an entanglement here um but the answer is no. Um, Chapel Hill and Durham are pretty separate when you're down here, uh, especially like as far as like universities go. I don't know if that's by design because it's like I don't want to go over to Duke and they don't want to come over here because it's like a pride thing. Um, but like, you know, we're out and about. I'm I'm basically going to stay here. Honestly, mostly just it's boring. But for like convenience, like I'm, I don't really feel like driving 20 minutes to go to a bar over there. And um, I think it's it's the same here. But uh, I'd be curious, like, I don't know. And, and it doesn't strike me as there's been too many like friendships of Duke and UNC players, like over the years in terms of like, you know, we're going to be buddies off the court and go grab a beer after the game. Like, I don't know of many, if, if any, um, that's the way rivalries are supposed to, be. and it's supposed to, be. it's, it's the way it's supposed to be. And that's the way I, I kind of operate too. Like, you know, I, I don't usually have many friends on opposing teams. It's just like kind that. of, it's just kind of the way it goes. Like, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I'm always one to be like, well, because you know, I'm a Bears fan, so 
Um, no, when I watch a bear, before. when I watch a bears game and they play the Packers and then I see, we always lose to Joe's Packers. I mean, everyone knows that we always lose to the Packers. Yeah. There's nothing more infuriating than getting the, our teeth kicked in by green Bay. And then the game's over and these guys just go over and they start hugging and kissing and laughing with each other. Yeah. It's just, I get it. You secured the bag. I understand that. I respect that. No doubt about it. But like, you know, just have some respect, I, I feel like, for the rivalry. So that's refreshing to hear that because I think that is more of a college thing. Like, I, I just feel like the college – and that's why I love college sports. Like, I tell these guys all the time, college football, college basketball, in my opinion, is so much more fun to watch than the pro version. Yeah. And I think it is because of that level of intensity and how you guys yeah. have so much pride in those rivalry games. It, they're just – to me, they're just wildly entertaining because of that. Yeah, I mean, like, like I, I agree. I, I find it odd, actually. Like a lot of times, I get, it. and like you said, the pro is a little different. You've made, you made your money. Right. A lot of times, you, you've maybe even been traded from a team. You might have played with the guys. So sure. it's, I get there's some differences, but, uh, like two, two games are like I, we played Notre Dame, and like I, I'm friends with some of the guys on the team still, like good friends. Played with them for you know a number of years, um, but like on game day, like I don't it's no disrespect. I'm not going up to hug you. I'm not going up like, and I don't think they want that either because it's like, you know, we're playing each other and like, we beat them by, you know, however much we beat them by. I'm not going to be like giving them bear hugs after the game. It's kind of like, you know, we're, we're good friends. I'll, I'll text you in, in, a, in a week or two and we'll catch up. But like, yeah. I'm not like we're that. And, but that's just kind of the way I, I think I'm wired. I think a lot more college guys may, might be like that, but I think too now, like, with social media and everything and, and, and a lot of the, the younger generation growing up, I think there is a little bit more buddy, buddy in the sport. Yeah. Is, you know, it's my thing is, it's, it's a, I think it's unfortunate. I I'm kind of cut from the cloth of like, if you're, if you're my opponent, it's, you know, I'd, I'd rather bury under the court than give you a high five, but mm, good for you. It's, I love that. Uh, let me put in my UNC future real quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right though. I mean, I'm I, only I kind of kidding. Me. So there's nothing more like infuriating to somebody as a fan. When you watch yeah. your team, like lose a hard fuck game, like Mikey said. And then after the game, it's like, you know, the guys are shrugging it off. Like it doesn't matter. I'll tell you one thing. I just went to my first UFC event and that was, you want to talk about guys who want to kill each other and literally try to, that was pretty cool. But I do like that at competitive edge because I think it, uh, it brings and enhances the game script. I think it makes watching it as an, uh, like an outside objective viewer. It makes a lot more interesting and fun when you see like, even with playoffs, I think playoffs brings out the best of any sport. You know, you watch even a sport like baseball. It's, you know, they lose 10 games in a row. Nobody cares. But when it's in the playoffs, every pitch counts, every every at-bat counts. And it, and, it, and it intensifies and makes the viewing experience so much better. So I completely agree with you. 100%. Dick, we got some more questions. So are we out on the jersey swap then at the end of games? Are we is that is that a no-go on the jersey swap? <laughs> Doesn't we, sound uh, like, that's yeah, a good we, question. I went listen, I, I wish we had more jerseys to give out. I think my equipment guy would kill us if we gave away our jersey because we don't have <laughs> really? we, could, like, we could we could order new ones. Like Jordan is 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 definitely gonna they they, they treat us mighty fine over here. I'll say sure. that. Uh, I would imagine but it's the a hell of a college, sponsor, let me tell you. Yeah, it is. I mean, the big fella himself went here. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh I mean, if you're, yeah, if Jordan's not going to take care of UNC, they're not taking care of nobody. Exactly. So, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, we don't, we don't have jerseys. Like, we have our jerseys, we're playing in them. So, like, in the NBA, I think it's a little different. They can kind of give them away and, um, NFL, same thing, but no jersey. I don't, I haven't seen a college jersey swap, maybe ever. Wow. Maybe ever. True. That's a good point. Um, let's do one more. Uh, we got one from Quinn Van Gallen. Uh, and this is one I'm interested in as well. Uh, what's your pregame routine? Any weird superstitions or anything that you're very particular about before a game? That one, Jake. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the pregame routine is, is long and not really by design. It's kind of just how we work as a team. It's, it's, it starts like, so on a game, I'll walk you through if a game is at 7 PM tip off. We're in the building at noon um, and we're staying here. And basically you're, you're here, you're getting uh, any sort of treatment, physical treatment, you know, uh, massage, ankle tape, you know, whatever. Um, and we've got shoot around five hours before um, and pregame meal four hours before. And so that's 
basically pretty standard. And so you do that, you shoot, you have your shoot around team shoot around, um, pregame meal after that. Um, I'll take a nap. Usually I'll take a nap in our, in our locker room. We've got couches like, uh, kind of sleep pods, whatever. It's nice, very nice setup. Um, I'll take a nap usually about 30 minutes, like pretty quick. Um, and then I'll head in to start getting like loose. We do like our lower body prep, which is kind of physical, you know, band work, mobility, stretching. Um, that's usually maybe hour and a half, two hours before the game. And then you're getting taped and then you're on, we're on the court, uh, usually 70 minutes before tip off for team stretch. So then you go through the whole team warm up. So like the doors open, the fans can kind of come and gather to watch that. Um, but that's, that's even, that's like still over an hour before the game. So like everything kind of gets backed way up because there's just a lot to do. There's a lot to take care of and everyone wants to check all the boxes. So, um, it gets a little tedious. I've gotten used to it. Obviously I've been playing college ball for a long time, but, um, it's not like, like, I, it's kind of crazy. Like in high school, you just, I got class, I got class at three 30. I got a game at four. Here we go. Like lace them up. You're on the court. You stretch maybe five, 10 minutes take a couple layup lines, you're done. Like you're playing. Um, this is different. Like this is five, six hours of just meals, shooting around prep, what have you. So, um, it's long, it's, it's, it's a lot, but it's good. I mean, you know, if you're not loose after that, you're in trouble. Like, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Um, but then wow, look, like on the road, it's a little different because you're trying, you got to travel from the hotel to the arena, which takes some time. Um, you don't have like, the access to the court because the other team's got it whatnot um in the tournament it's way different you get 30 minutes on the court so you got to do all your kind of prep and stretching like in a back hallway somewhere um so that's like a, a different like the tournament format you basically it is kind of like roll the balls out you 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 go out there 30 minutes you do some layup lines you shoot you go back to the huddle you come back out and then you're playing you know so it's a little different tournament format which i kind of like sometimes you got to get ready to roll and just go 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 play um but anyway, kind of a boring answer there, but that's, that is, no, the I think it's good to give the inside scoop. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of cool to hear, you know, from somebody who's not in, in that, you know, world to hear it. I, I have one last question for you. Obviously you grew up in New York and this is your last year, you know, as a senior in college, um, who's your like dream NBA team. If you were to pick a team that you'd like to play for, like being from New York, are you like a Knicks fan? Are you, is there a team that would be like, a dream come true, like as a kid that you envision playing with? Yeah, great question. Um, the the a, the actual answer, as I go into pre-draft and everything after this year, is like I'll play for whoever wants me to play for them. Like that's yeah. that's that's the true answer. But um, if we're talking like growing up as a kid, Knicks for sure. Um, playing at MSG, MSG would, be would be unreal. Like we've I've, we played there once this year. Um, it's just so historic. Uh, and the Knicks right now are like, so I'm a Knicks fan. I'm a Jets fan. So my life has been tough. I'm a Mets <laughs> fan. My life has been tough. Like, oh, so yeah, man, it's, man. I, I've got a tough trio, but the Knicks are on the up and up and say, so the Jets. we stole That's, your boy. Told Rogers. Bobby it was today. very sad. Very sad. What happened to, to Rogers? He's going to be back. He's yeah. Bob, back. Bob, Bob killed Rogers. So <laughs> yeah, he completely yeah. mushed him. It was, it was awful. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the reality is, is like, yeah, Knicks would be amazing. I, I love uh, the way the Miami Heat have kind of built their organization. I, I kind of love the uh, the underdog mentality down there. Uh, obviously, Miami is a fun city. Um, good little tax break, too, if we're talking about. Oh, yeah. Let yeah. me tell you. Yeah. So, but listen, there's there's a lot of teams. And, and the NBA is in a weird spot, too, because it's like a lot of teams have are flipping the script. Like the Thunder were – Everyone was writing them off. Now they're great. They're young. Minnesota. They're yeah. Minnesota, you know, the even the magic, like the Orlando magic are, you know, I think fourth in the East, they're climbing. Sacramento Kings were terrible for years. For years, they were terrible. And then they're making runs in the playoffs. So like, it's a cool time in the NBA because a lot of franchises are kind of picking up where they they hadn't been. Um, so listen, I'll play for anybody that wants me. So anyone who's listening can know that, but yeah, the Knicks, uh, the Knicks, maybe Miami, something like that. I tell you who would love to have you, and that's the Philadelphia 76ers. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have you. Special. It's a match it's made in Abitag. You're a Philly I tell guy. you what. 
If if he goes to the Knicks, though, that would be. I mean, I could go and watch him play all the time. I'm trying to go that's see him play. Good. It's tough for me, you know, in Jersey with the kids, man. But the Knicks, I mean, that's 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 a Uber ride away. That's a that's a slam dunk, no pun intended. Uh, Cormac, we do a we do a uh, um, what do you want to call it? A uh, section, mm-hmm. not a section, a segment, a segment, yeah, segment. Yeah, we do a segment on the show called "He's a Problem." Uh, oh, who's he's a, who's a problem and who's a problem it could be a good problem it could be a bad problem it's just somebody who has stuck out to you of the last week or so in the sports world uh typically we do sports world a problem good or bad so we could uh we could we could go around the horn we'll end with you okay. uh that way you know you could see kind of what we're talking about so tick do you want to lead off uh who's a problem this week sure i'll i'll lead off uh, um so I'm going to go against the grain. I'm not going to stick with sports, mainly because of what's affected me today. Okay. This Marriott Bonvoy Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it cuts out right in the middle. Right in the show. middle. That's a problem. Okay. <laughs> that would be great. These Sheratons, these Marriotts, they got you by the balls. They don't offer you Wi-Fi unless you're a part of the Bonvoy program. And even when you are a part of that, they tell you, sorry, it's out and it's gone. They need to be better, and I think they will after the fight that I put up tomorrow when I'm checking out. <laughs> Good for you. I'm going to let them have it. Good for you. Because we got Cormac on, and it, it was it threw a wrench in the whole day. They knew Cormac was coming on. This problem would have got addressed. And it was such a yeah. We this was the last thing we wanted to deal with, but uh, up to this point, it's been all right. Yeah, it's been but fine. Uh, that's who's a problem this week for me. Joseph, you want to go, or you want me to go? I'm going to go with not necessarily a person, but a thing. These Tommy John surgeries, elbow injuries, now that's going to affect Garrett Cole, dude. I'm telling you what, how many pitchers You're selling medical procedures? Be- <laughs> I'm just, no, I'm not selling that. I'm selling the injury. Like, pitchers can't stay healthy anymore. It's unbelievable. It's one of the situations where, like, there was no lead up that he was hurt. There was no, like, disclosure. And now all of a sudden, the guy might miss the entire year and ruin the entire year for the Yankees. And and this happens more often than not, where guys who's who's the pitcher for the Mets that had it last year, uh, Degrom, out for the yeah. entire year. Tommy John, it's it's a shame. It's a fucking it's it. it they got to be better with with modern day medicine and all the shit that they got today. You can't tell me that they can't prevent a guy who pitches once a week from being out for an entire year with the surgical procedure. It's a problem, Mikey, and you know it. It's a Yankee. I feel game. like I feel it's like you're. I feel like problem. clearly I feel like, have never played baseball. Feel like he thinks I'm Garrett, not a baseball guy. I'm just like, saying. I feel like Garrett Cole's the the problem more so than anything else right now. For well, Garrett. I don't want to pin it on him. Poor sure. guy's going through enough. Poor he guy. Is. He is. Poor guy. <laughs> I need him. I need him. Guy? I'm a Mets guy. So wow. Um, no, Degrom hurt us. I mean, I, I I hear you. I'm. I would sell that too. I think. I think those guys would sell it as well. Imagine you had DeGrom with Scherzer and then um, what's his name? Uh, Verlander. Uh, Verlander. My God, you guys would have been unbelievable. I'm pretty sure any pitcher who's had to undergo Tommy John surgery would sell Tommy John surgery, Joe. Anyone <laughs> who's undergone the surgery. Well, I'm selling it. I'm going to tell you it's a problem, Joe. And, I, and you know, this isn't going to be a surprise for anybody who's followed the program for some time. But I, I, I'm sorry I have to say it. Jake Paul, man. Jake Paul, this this Mike Tyson Mike, fight. You've what got to month, end this month, narrative, man. No, this it's, money, that's a good stat. It, it is, right, Cormac? I mean, listen, I Mike Tyson <laughs> is going to be 58 years old he when this beat guy's him. fight. It's not going to – Joe, listen, Tyson's the baddest motherfucker to ever walk the planet. I'm not debating that. But, I mean, he ha- he is 30 years Jake Paul senior. Jake Paul will never be respected in the boxing realm ever. So I, I, but honestly, at this point, I don't think he cares. And that's fine because God knows how many millions of dollars he's going to get off of this fight. So I, again, I respect the bag grab, but I mean, at what point, and I'm going to, I'm going to watch the fight. I mean, I'm a Netflix subscriber, so I'll watch the fight. I mean, I feel (laughs) bad for the people that are going to buy Netflix. I feel bad for the people that are going to buy Netflix to watch that fight though. That's ridiculous. It's Everybody ridiculous. has Netflix already, Mikey. Don't pretend they don't. I'm selling Jake. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Jake Paul's a problem. He's a problem, Joe. He's got to fight a real fighter. He's got to fight an actual a problem. Apparently, I'll tell you what, Mikey. We sat years. behind Logan. We sat behind Logan Paul the other night. Yeah, he's shredded. I, he, he. So he what? Damage you, Mikey. He would what? He would. He would kick your ass. No, he wouldn't. 
I think he would. Logan Paul. You don't think you don't think that Logan Paul would kick your ass? No, no, no. He's oh, a glor- yeah, oh my God, Mikey, are you out of your mind? He's a glorified ballerina, Logan Paul. That's what he is. Now, Jake how Paul. Big, Jake is- Paul's a fighter. What? How big are these guys? How big are these guys? Uh, yeah. I, well, Jake's got it. Jake's Jake's got to be a decent. I think they're both guy. like he, six, he, he six, fights six, crew. Six, he six, fights six, cruiser six, light light heavyweight. So he fights at like one eighty five, one ninety. They're tall kids. I, I think I think they are. Um, they're he not is Log- Logan Paul six foot two. There you go. He's this guy's gonna this guy's gonna kick my ass, Joe. This guy. That's an oh, Mikey. That is such an outdated <laughs> picture. Photo, uh, listen, that's the picture I found. That was the first picture on Google. <laughs> I can't control Google, Joe. Oh, this guy you know. Not- Cormac, do you have do you have a problem for us? Yeah, I got a problem. This is a, kind of a random one. I just saw it. It's a thing too. You might know about. It. I mean. There's uh high school basketball has no shot, shot clock. clock. A lot yeah. of states. It's a good one. Um good one. At Jersey, I know they don't have it. I'm seeing a video. The team holds the ball the whole, the whole game. quarter. I know. The whole quarter. It's, the, embarrassing. And then they, it's, it's embarrassing. It's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to the sport. And it's I, I looked it up. There's eight states that have shot clocks, eight out of fifty. Yeah, it's um, bad. That's bad. That's really How bad. How did he not get fouled or turn the ball over? Well, so they, it turns into like a, a stalemate because the one team's holding it and the other team's in, in the zone. And they're like, it becomes a whole thing. Like, well, we're not going to come out of the zone. And they're like, well, we're not going to shoot it. Yeah. And so it literally you got like the moms in the stands cheering. Happen, got, it happened to me playing in Jersey, Joe. We played in the count. We played in the county tournament when I was in high school. And we played, we went up against a very high seated team. And we were we were hanging with them the whole first quarter, and all of a sudden their coach just stopped playing. Like they would, they got a lead, they got like a six or eight point lead, and they just held the ball, and they didn't do anything. They didn't pass it. The guy just literally would dribble it, not do anything, and then just hold it, and you can't do anything. You can't do anything. He's right. He's on. You foul him. It's it's no, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem actually. Now that I think about it, I'm yes, starting it to is. get more. I'm getting He's more getting wound up about it because <laughs> the uh, the whole thing too is like. It's lazy coaching because the coaches are just, you know, oh, yeah, we're not going to do anything. And it's bad for the kids, man. Like, you're not teaching these kids how to play within the confines of the shot clock, which is how you're supposed to play in college and in the NBA. And you get these situations that are just complete. They're just – it's a clown show. You got two teams staring at each other for eight minutes straight, and then the buzzer goes off. It's like, what the hell are we doing? That's awful, man. There's, there's, awful. there's an episode – was Massachusetts with the states with the shot clock? Yeah, we had shot clock in Massachusetts, shot clock in New York. So I never dealt with it, um, but I'm seeing these videos. It's, it's ludicrous. It's unbelievable. Reminds me of an episode I watched ages ago of The Simpsons. They were showing um, the soccer announcers, and like the the top three guys are just passing the ball back and forth, and they're not moving. <laughs> yeah. And like the the American commentator is like, now he passes back to him, and he passes him, and then they 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 show the Latino commentator, and he's like losing his mind, but they're not moving the ball; they're just passing it back and forth. That's that's literally what it reminds me of. That's that's outrageous. That's not how basketball is meant to be played. That's a hell of a problem to have. Yeah, I mean, hey, first problem ever. <laughs> first of many, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. That's a great. That is a good one. It's a good one. And it's been a problem. I mean, listen, that's a problem that's been around. Like I just said, I mean, I was in high school 20 years ago. Believe that or not. I was in high school that's 20 years ago. That's a problem. That's a, problem. a big, that's a problem. That's a problem for, for everybody. That's, I mean, the fact you were in high school 20 years ago is also a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's getting a little long in the tooth for me. No, yeah. yeah, I listen. I'd love to have him back. This is great. Poor Mac. Poor Mac. Listen, you, in, in, ten, in 10 years, you'll see. You'll see. No, I, listen, I, I hear you. I, I get the I'm getting a, a lot of commentary. You, you have to get your balls broken a lot. Oh, uh, you wouldn't like you wouldn't believe. I mean, Mike, look at look at my like you go to my comment section on on every post. It's get a job. You're 25, you're a grandpa. I was in, you know, your oh. teammate was in seventh grade when you were it's like it's true. It's all true, but it's like, what do you want me to do? What if do? Cormac Ryan's a grandpa, I'm a fucking dinosaur. <laughs> awesome. And Joe, Joe, you should fucking chime in too. You're 38, also 37. I'm young and hard, Mikey. <laughs> I'm very right, young and hard. All right, Sinatra, thank you very much. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Know. Cormac has been nothing but a pleasure. Yeah, I mean, for our, hundred, our hundredth episode, you've been sensational. And I tell you what, if anybody listening to you now isn't rooting for you in the oh target, my God, bro. 
then they can go get bent because as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> you are you are you are a guy who we should be rooting for. Absolutely. We really appreciate you taking your time to to sit down and chat with us. And you are welcome anytime, especially after you win that March Madness championship. We go do dinner and we can come we'll do a live on episode. We'll do a live episode. Wow. Steak dinner. From the steakhouse. If, I'll, I'll if UNC if UNC tomahawk. makes the final four, I will I will do everything within my power to be there. Everything we within will, my hey, power. Hey, Phoenix, Phoenix is not a bad city. Phoenix has got no. a lot to offer. You just spent two weeks there. I know. Yeah, you, we were, you we were there. Stranger to Arizona. I mean, you guys no. are out, out and about. So, well, thank you so much, man. We really thank appreciate you. Very you. Much, Nothing but awesome. the best. Really best of luck in your tournament, and obviously in the March Madness tournament, we will be rooting vehemently for you. Thank you, boys. I appreciate it. We appreciate care, you, brother. Take care, Cormac yes, Ryan. I tell you it's what, man, that, that young man is is well spoken and uh, and just a. a, a I'm serious. I'm 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 going all in on UNC to win the tournament. I am. I just I am. might too. I, I think I the guy. That. I think the guy just gets it, bro. He's a dog. He's a dog, and he's By not the way, only I, one. You got Baycott. You got R.J. Davis. That team's fucking R.J. Loaded. Davis is unbelievable. R.J. Davis loaded, man. Best scoring UNC guards of all time. Team may be yeah. built for something real magical. Come, come, we'll come, April. This. I love that we got him involved with the who's a problem or what's a problem because yeah. I thought his his answer was excellent. Oh, perfect. That was one perfect. of the best ones we've had in a long time. That was perfect. That was, I tell you what, I was so nervous about my Wi-Fi that entire. You were fun. You held up. Yeah, you held fun. up. I, 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 just time want, more tick. I just didn't want to talk. I was so nervous because I always hate when I'm watching podcasts and they start cutting out. I get so frustrated and I, I didn't want to be that problem on this episode. But Mikey, I thought you did a great job uh, sort of leading us through that. Joe, you were great too. And and Cormac, what a... He was a great. great time. He, he was, was great, was, man. What a, what a, I mean, you know what? Like you get some of these guys, man, and we've been in the game now long enough. Like you get some of these guys and, you, you know, you want them to come on the pod, but you really never know what you're going to get. Like he could have very easily, you get guys who show up on their cell phone in a car. I mean, this guy was fucking posted up in front of the fucking logo. Yeah, the tar heel behind I mean, him. this guy treated it like he was getting interviewed by ESPN. And you know what? That's professionalism. Hey, the purpose is Mikey. All intents and purposes. No, he's not wrong. Yeah, you're not wrong, Joe. You're not wrong. <laughs> but, but I mean, that is something that will establish him, in my opinion, as a man who will always have my respect. I mean, a just a, just a kid who you could tell was raised the right way, um, says all the right things. He's not a kid. I mean, he's a 25 year old man. I mean, he's not a kid. Yeah. Um, but uh, best of luck to UNC and the UNC fans. I mean, you guys deserve it. I mean, that team is team is a very good team. So we'll see. Um, I'll tell you what, too. I would love to hear, you know, anyone listening in the comments, if you enjoy the interview experience. Sure, sure. I thought it was very, I mean, obviously he was great, but I thought it flowed great. And I think it, it, it you know, it sets a new opportunity for us moving forward as a sportsman. Yes. I think it's fun, man. I, it makes me want to do more of these. Yeah, and we're, um, we're looking to add that. So if, if people really enjoyed the interview and you think it's better to have a guest on every, you know, let's say once a month or something along those yeah. lines, uh, we could definitely make that happen between the three of us. So if that's something that you're interested in, please comment and let us know uh, what you, what you thought about it. Um, are we going to transition to NFL free agency? Transition here. I think Mike. we can do a, a, a quick little bit. I mean, I know you've been chomping at the bit, Mikey, to get into some of this free agency stuff. So why don't we just jump in, right? Okay, let's jump, right right into, let's jump right in. Let's jump. We did right fewer in. questions with Cormac. We did. Who's a problem? All we have left is one topic, and it's a big topic. I'm sure we could talk a while about it, but let's dive right in. Free agency was crazy uh, this week, but specifically today. A lot of moves. Um, I don't know who we want to start with, but there's Saquon, Josh Jacobs, Dondre Swift, a bunch of guys. Why don't we start with Saquon? Because he's probably one of the bigger names, along with Chris Jones sticking around in KC. Saquon to Philadelphia. How do you feel about it, Tick? Uh, listen, I love Saquon. He's a friend of yours. I, I've only heard the greatest things about him. He played at Penn State. That was the school I, I loved growing up. I, I love everything about him outside of that he was a New York Giant for such a long time. Um, I, I wonder truly how much of an upgrade it is from DeAndre Swift because um, he had a great Chicago first Bear, DeAndre Swift. I know, I know. I wonder how much of an up if that was a position we even really needed an upgrade in tremendously. And even DeAndre Swift has got as good as he was. We just stopped running the football at the end of the year. So even if Saquon's on the team, 
and we decide to stop running the football, uh, how's that going to work? We just lost one of the best centers in football. It's going to be certainly not as good as the line as we had last year. I, I'm so questioning it. I, I, I'm, I'm obviously excited because he's an unreal talent, but I'm, I'm questioning how much better the team, the team got. I mean, they got significantly better ticket. I mean, you have a premier running back who, for the last, you know, two to three years, has been facing stacked boxes because, quite frankly, teams don't respect, you know, the quarterback and the wide receivers that the New York Giants were playing with bottom five um, of the think, bottom five of the league I offensive mean, line not bottom to mention five of the league one of, in, in quarterback one of the worst play. offensive lines yeah what i mean he's going to one of the i know you lost kelsey but he's going to one of the better offensive lines in the league with i don't know about that with, with with jalen hurts who is a running quarterback that you got to respect that and then he's got great wide outs on both ends uh, I think it's going to open up holes that he is going to be able to gash and and be very successful. And and not to mention his his pass catching ability out of the backfield in the last couple of years has really improved. Um, I think he's going to be a great weapon for you guys. I think he's going to be awesome. And by the way, Mikey, from a reliable source that I have, I heard it came down to the wire. They went with the Eagles eventually, but it was the Bears and the Eagles were the two teams that he was going to uh, go to. It was to. Bears, Texans, Eagles, from what I understand. Yeah. But um, the last two, from what I understand, was the Bears and Eagles. And ultimately, and apparently the Packers made a play late and offered a big play at him too, but it was too late. So Yeah, I, I got to be honest. I'm glad the Bears didn't splash on, on Saquon, uh, only because, not that I don't think he's a tremendous player. I, I think he is a tremendous player when he's healthy and when he's on the field. I just think the Bears just they need to spend their money elsewhere in my opinion. So I was happy with the swift deal. It wasn't that crazy of a deal. Um, so I was happy about that, but Saquon to the Eagles, man. Uh, listen, the giants fans are going to have no lost love for Saquon now because you know, he goes to the arch rival him and him and TK Tiki Barber are going back and forth on Twitter. I mean, it's ugly. It's ugly. Um, but Tiki Barber shouldn't have said what he said. Like he what shouldn't have said Barber to be talking. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Tiki, oh, Tiki Barber really shouldn't have went there. Break. Um, but you know, Tiki Barber, you got to understand now is in that radio shock jock mode. He's, he's on the afternoon drive on the fan, which is the biggest, you know, that's the biggest, radio show other than the morning show boomer and and um and geo that is the the afternoon drive is the biggest sports radio spot in the country if you're new york uh afternoon drive so he's gonna say stuff just to grab headlines i think that if tiki really th that was just so ridiculous but overall i mean eagles locked up landon dickerson which i think was gigantic for them they paid him a lot of money but they had to make sure that that old line was still going to be in somewhat tack but now man the pressure the pressure on Jalen Hurts. Now you got Slim Reaper out there. You got A.J. Brown out there. You got Dallas Goddard out there. You got yeah. Saquon out there. Man, oh I mean, God. you are talking about some of the most talented guys at their respective positions across the entire field Hurts now. I mean, can't do it now. Yeah, um, I mean, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. It's going to be a lot of pressure. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a matter of can he do it? Is the play calling going to be right? Are they going to, you know, really rely on Saquon? Or are they going to kind of you know, do what they did with Swift and kind of tease it a little bit. But I, I hope they don't. I think I think they're going to use them a lot. But the running backs today just flew off the board. You had Saquon. You had Josh just Jacobs. Right now, Mikey, you see this? Yeah, I saw. Um, Joe I, Mixon I saw really... Mixon got cut, which I said was going to happen last week. I and tweeted Zach that. Zach Moss just signed a deal with two year deal with the Bengals. Zach Moss, and you got uh, Eckler going to the Commanders. You got about, how about Josh Jacobs coming to the Packers? Yep, yep. I mean, there was a lot of and Derrick Henry still doesn't have a home. Derrick Henry still Aaron on free, Aaron Jones a free agent yep, now. Yep. So it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be very interesting with the running backs. But I think you know what this means really traditionally in free agency. If one position is getting hammered, often uh, it's because the draft class really doesn't provide that much in the regard of, of whatever position it is respectfully. So the running back position, I think this speaks to the level of running back class coming out in this draft. Why all these running backs all of a sudden started getting snagged up uh, today. As soon as the, uh, the opening bell, if you want to call it for the tampering period started. But why the only, so a lot of these things make sense to me, the Joe Mixon being, being released thing. He is a premier talent. I, I don't understand why they would want to let him go other than to free up space. Um, but uh, they did. So moving on, Joe, you want to talk a little bit about Josh Jacobs to the Packers? Do you think it makes you better? Do you like the move? How do you feel about it? 
it's tough, man, because Aaron Jones for in in many ways embodied Green Bay in so many ways. He was the leader of that team. He'd been there through thick and thin. He was committed to being a Packer for ultimately, I think, as far as his career went, just a hard-nosed, hard-working guy, great attitude. Um, it's going to be really tough to see him go. Um, that being said, you know, his contract was coming up. I don't know if they just couldn't come to a negotiation with him. Um, and he's also been banged up the last several years, you know, like he hasn't played a full year, you know, and they've been throwing out AJ Dillon there. So maybe they were a little bit concerned. Health I mean, Joe, you hate, you hate AJ Dillon. So AJ Dillon is not it. He's a free agent and I don't think they're going to resign him, but I'm saying that they, yeah, Aaron Jones was hurt much of the year this year. And if you go back to the year before he was also hurt. So they had to play AJ Dillon a lot and they had yeah. to get him next. And even when they had Aaron Jones a few years ago as a as kind of like the bell cow, he got hurt late in the season against in the playoffs. And, you know, we really didn't have anybody else. I think they need a guy who can be a bell cow running back. Now, I understand Jacobs was hurt this year, but if you look throughout his career, he's been able to play a majority of his seasons and he's been very successful and shown that he can run the ball 20 to 30 times in a game and do damage. And I think that's exactly what he, what they need. Plus he's like three or four years younger than Aaron Jones. He's 25. I think they're going to use him a lot. Uh, my only hope is that he stays healthy. And if he does, I think he could be a, a, a big dynamic piece for us. But that being said, I'll, I'll really miss Aaron Jones. He was a great player for us for a long time. If they're going to let Jones and Dylan walk, I mean, it, Jacobs is going to get a lot of work. I you mean, and he, they're paying him a lot of money. I, I mean, listen, they're paying him a lot, a lot. I mean, I don't want to say more money than I would like to pay him because I don't want to make it sound like I'm just being anti-Packer. But between him and Xavier McKinney today, the Packers invested a lot of money in two positions that you know, but the Bears did the same thing. I mean, not to the degree that the Packers did. They did not spend the same amount of money, not nearly on Bayard and Swift. But it's very ironic, I think, that the Bears and Packers both start off with adding a safety and a running back in free agency. It's just funny how things like that work McKinney out. Kenny is a gamer, though, man. No, he yes, he's a baller. Good. He's a baller. No doubt about it. Very, very. And Andre Swift, you should, I would be over the moon if I was you about Andre Swift, man. No, I think Swift. I think Swift will be good. He I think Swift will really be good. Talented. I loved him He's in Philly last year. I always was saying I don't understand why they don't give the guy the ball. He looked awesome last year. I know, and and before that in Detroit, he did have some injury history. But you know, if he can stay healthy the same way he did last year, I think you got a real a real nice back on your hands. As long as you make some offensive line <laughs> decisions there and maybe improve that a little bit. Um, what else we got? We got Chris Jones. We were talking a lot about him. He ended up staying in KC. How uh, about cousins to Atlanta? Cousins to Atlanta. Jerry that is, the Browns. I told you. That is I told crazy. You. There I is no, how, there is no market for Justin Fields. None. There is none. It's I'll non-existent. Take it's non-existent. I'll take I mean, You would, but the, 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 there's one of two things happening with Justin Fields right now. Either there's no market for him. No market. When I say no market, I mean a realistic market. The Bears are not going to trade Justin Fields for a sixth or seventh round draft pick. No. They, they would be better served, even a fifth rounder. They'd be better served to just keep him at that point. And they don't have to pay him much. It's the last year of his rookie deal. They're not going to do the fifth year option. So there's either two things happening. There's no realistic market or fair market for him, or the Bears aren't shopping him. Rappaport said today that the Bears... They 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 had no intention of shopping them up until this point, which is exactly what I said on Friday on Twitter that got me completely wrapped up into this two day long back and forth with a million people on Twitter going nuts about me saying that. But the fact remains, the Falcons were supposed to be the suitor. No. Tampa Bay, we were supposed to figure out with Baker. He's staying there. The Steelers were supposed to be a suitor. They went with Russell Wilson on a one million dollar deal. The uh the Raiders deal, were supposed to what? What? One point million? No, one point two million on the league minimum. They're paying Russell Wilson. Oh my god! Well, they're paying him getting, nothing. Is he's getting paid out on the? On yes. The other. Yes. Then the so Raiders. Then the Raiders him. were supposed to be the next suitor for Fields. They literally NFL people who get paid to do this for a living 
put out that Justin Fields and the Raiders were in serious trade talks. I am not exaggerating. Three minutes later, Gardner Minshew gets uh, brought in by the Raiders. So, yeah, but is he going to be a starter there? This, yeah, of course. I, I, well, he's going to battle with Aiden O'Connell for the starting position. But here's oh. this is what I'm saying: Who is going to be the suitor now for Justin Fields? The Vikings. I don't see the Bears trading him in inside the division. I think it would be very foolish to do that, especially if the return's not going to be big enough. Who else? The Giants, maybe? The Broncos, maybe? Yeah, the Giants, but but maybe. the main suitors who everyone said, he's going to go there, he's going to go there. He's not there. He's not there. And every day that passes that he's not traded. By the way, Tampa was another team too, and they re-signed Baker Mayfield. I that's mean, right. That's, that's what I said. One. Yep, yep, yep. I don't you know, know who should be looking at him is Seattle. Seattle. That's Seattle. another. Absolutely. That's another team that they had discussed. Yep. Yep. Because Geno Smith ain't it, man. He ain't it. They seems, you know, fine with them though. They don't seem to be trying to make a move there, which is baffling. But they're not. Um, I mean, yeah, that's a bad. I mean, we've got Austin Eckler to Washington. I don't know if we think that's worth talking what about, about. What about T. Higgins requesting a trade? I mean, that that really is interesting because feed me there's... T. Higgins, but man, we don't have the capital to grab him. I don't think they'd have to I, trade I a future, a future team. second. Uh, what about the future. Jets? Imagine the Jets get T. Higgins with Garrett Wilson and then Aaron Rodgers. Throw. I mean, that they, is a dive they bomb. definitely they definitely need. A uh, another wide out. They lost. Oh, Bry- they lost their pass rusher Bryce Huff today, but they have an embarrassment of riches on defense. So I don't think that that's big of a deal for the Jets. I'll tell you who made out today is the New York Giants with Brian Burns. They Brian absolutely Burns. stole Brian Burns from Carolina, a second round pick and a fifth round pick for a guy who Carolina didn't want to give up for two first round picks only a season ago. They didn't want to give this guy up for two first rounders. This this season they give him up for a second and a fifth. Now the Giants are overpaying Brian Burns. They're giving him 150 million dollars, 80 something guaranteed. But that's the league. I mean, the league just overpays for guys in free agency. That's the way it always goes. But in terms of compensation for uh, on the pick end, I think that the Giants stole Brian Burns from from uh, Carolina. So that, in addition to a couple offensive linemen that Giants just brought in, including one of Joe's Packers, John Runyon, they brought in. The Giants are making some low-key nice moves. They still need a ton of wide receiver help. They have none. And they, of course, the quarterback now. They bring in Devin Singletary to replace Saquon Barkley. Um, I think they overpaid Singletary a little bit too. But again, that's kind of just the way free agency goes. How about the Raiders Bro, taking Wilkins off the Miami? Ah, now that's a that's, major deal, man. That's a major oh, deal. Yes. And I re- really, that's a guy that I would have loved to see Chicago, but Chicago's never going to pay anybody $110 million. Um, But him paired with Max Crosby now, I mean, listen, they got those Pat Mahomes rules, man. They want to punish Pat. I think that, that, Ad- that Antonio Pierce is hell-bent on, if nothing else, to make that team be the thorn in Patrick Mahomes' side moving forward. I mean, they I certainly think, have been. I think everything he's going to do in the draft and otherwise is going to revolve around one thing and one thing only, getting enough guys in that defense to smother Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. And you know what? Hats off to him because whatever they did last year, it worked, and he he turned it around a little bit there. So exciting times over there in Vegas if you're a Raider fan, I think. It's pretty cool to see. Bro, all the Carolina Panthers do is get fleeced. Oh, they, they send top tier talent away fucking tires. They for nothing. I mean, Christian McCaffrey, DJ Moore, and now uh Brian Burns. I mean, why even draft? Why if you're just gonna sell them for scraps? It's uh it's tough. It's tough. Um, all right, gentlemen, we touched on uh some free agency there. But this this episode was about Cormac Ryan. He was uh, a real treat. It was the first real guest we've had, certainly the first athlete guest we've had. Um, Mikey, I thought you did a great job sort of leading that. Um, and just what a fun time. And yeah, like Joe said earlier, let us know in the comments if you liked it, if you want to see more of that, because we can certainly make this happen at least once a, a month uh, while we're waiting for next football season. Um and we'll continue to talk about March Madness and, and baseball and all these other sports. But if you like the interview style, uh, let us know. Let us know for sure. Um, gentlemen, that's another episode of The Sportsman. Mikey, I thank you for helping with the Connect with Cormac, having him on the show. A lot of fun. Um, that's Mikey V. That's Joey D. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube and the Instagram. Send your questions in there. 
and Mr. Anderson will send them back to us. We'll answer them at the end of each episode. Uh, that's another one, guys. Till next week.